it's kind of hard to make that work in a movie. We definitely use our, our subwoofers. So when you hear that T-Rex roar, you're definitely going to feel it as well. So how do we know what a dinosaur sounded like if we weren't even there? A hot question that has puzzled me for a while now. My name is Julia Clark, and I'm a professor of paleontology at the University of Texas at Austin. Well, I actually study a lot of uh, recently deceased living animals as well as the long extinct ones. So to make sense of something like dinosaur sound, we have to really understand sound making in living animals. We can't discuss dinosaur sounds without talking about the classic film series, Jurassic Park. Well, I have to say the first Jurassic Park movie was um, was kind of cutting edge. It came out when I was in college and I was actually taking a comparative anatomy class. As now a professor of paleontology, I would say that the key things about it was the dinosaurs in that movie were much more agile. They were kind of, a lot of the, the raptor species were lightly built. They were had behaviors that were informed by looking at living birds. So it was a pretty cool movie. Now, if you look at the new series of Jurassic World movies, unfortunately, they just kind of gave up on that notion of really bringing dinosaur science to life. And the dinosaurs, to my mind, have regressed in large part. They look a lot more like dragons or kind of a Godzilla-esque thing than they do like uh, what we know about dinosaurs now. Hi, Cody. Do you want me to switch to video? I'm fine doing that. How's that? One of my early opportunities was as a sound re-recordist, and that was on Jurassic Lost World, Jurassic Park 2 Lost World. You know, the, the classic sound from Jurassic Park is the T-Rex roar. That is as much serendipity as it is creativity. You know, Gary and Steven knew exactly, you know, they, they knew they were looking for something completely unique that belonged to that T-Rex. Chris Boyce spent a lot of time recording animals, and um, it turned out that this baby elephant that Chris Boyce encountered, uh, it only bellowed once, but that unique, iconic sound and recording is now one of the most recognizable you know, vocalizations in, in cinema history. There's the, um, there's the, you know, famous sound of the, the raptors, the raptors barking, and that's tortoises mating. So, you know, if, if you were not there, you know, with a microphone at, at the zoo or at the animal shelter or whatever, getting these animals, you're not gonna come up with these, these new and unique sounds. So that's our process. A fascinating process, but how accurate is that iconic sound? I never really thought about if I believed it or not, it, because it just was so um, you know, you know in, in, ingrained on my brain when I first heard it. They have said they can't you know, accurately depict it, but they don't believe so. Um, they don't believe that it sounded like that. And so probably not. Um, yeah, probably not. Kind of looking at, at the science behind aspects of dinosaur sound, reconstructing dinosaur sound, your, your kids should be lowering their voice significantly. And then think about how big a T-Rex is. Okay. It's a really big animal. It isn't going to be sound like this. It's going to be, it's not even going to be the sound of the roar, but maybe much lower frequency than we're even able potentially to hear because our ears only hear certain frequency ranges. In lower frequency ranges, we just feel them. So let's give this a try. Here's a sound effect called low frequency. This is a production element used in many of your favorite Hollywood films. You have to listen carefully to hear it. If you happen to have headphones on, you may have even felt it. So here it is again, one more time. Listen close. 
Julie's research shows that one sound that dinosaurs could have made may have been even lower in frequency, and it would not produce well on today's standard speakers. Even if, you know, whether they had a larynx, T-Rex, or a syrinx, this, this structure down in the chest, they um, don't have lips. Uh, the structure of the tongue is very different. They don't really have like fleshy cheeks like we do. And these are all parts of making a roar sound, roar. Just think about when you do that yourself, you know? So we know this. That is probably not the sound of T-Rex. The, the challenge isn't so much about what did they sound like. You know, they've done research and, um, you know, when you are doing a literal film, let's say Lion King, you, you can go and record lions and you record lion cubs. And so the goal is to find that identifiable, iconic sound for each of these creatures. Now, our challenge with, with the new dinosaurs is, well, everybody's heard the T-Rex. It's the coolest sound in the world. And you always hear, well, it's got to be cooler than the T-Rex. So it's like, well, I'm out. The challenge is that the sounds from that classic film were so unique that they have become embedded in our brain. The same way, you know, the original lightsaber sound is embedded, or, you know, or the Millennium Falcon or something. You can't make anything cooler than that. You can just make something different. And it's difficult for some to imagine anything else. I do think we need to get away from roars. I think we need to look more at very low frequency avian sounds like bird sounds um and look more at the the properties of crocodilian sounds and sound making for our future movies about dinosaurs julie clark and her team are in the process of researching more about the sounds of large instinct animals she believes that the next generation could be the answer to profound discoveries and maybe the next generation of dinosaurologists the little kiddos that are out there today are gonna dream up new questions about dinosaurs if they could start from where we are now. You know, they could think of the new questions that we haven't yet thought to ask. So that's, that's gonna be exciting to see. And the last point I'll make on that is why are they all drooling? Birds don't drool, it's not a thing. And this whole excessive production of saliva is really uh, not uh, appropriate.